Hello and uh, welcome to this CE marking presentation. It's a short guide to what you need to know and do. Uh, let me introduce myself uh, a little more. Uh, I'm, a, as uh, Lawrence said, a product safety specialist at Tufsud. I've got about 20 years experience in compliance management and I've worked in manufacturing and retail supply before I came to Tufsud. CE marking is one of the most commonly misunderstood topics that we deal with. Um, this presentation will help clear up the myths and misconceptions and put you on the right track to compliance. We'll deal with legal obligations relating to your role regarding the product, enforcement and the due diligence defense, scopes and exemptions of uh, example directives, the ROS directive, EMC, LVD and RMTTE directives, uh, essential requirements of the directives and how to meet them through harmonized standards or otherwise. Additionally, we'll look at technical documentation that's required to demonstrate compliance, uh, the declaration of conformity, contents of the technical file, and how to put, pull together a technical file, and a little bit about placing products on the market or into service. And then as, at the end, as Lawrence has said, we'll have questions and answers. So what is CE marking? That's what the CE marking should look like, without the grid, of course. Uh, the smallest permitted size is 5 millimeters. If your product is too small to carry a 5 millimeter CE marking, then you can put that marking on the packaging instead. The CE marking is designed for free trade. It's not really there for consumers. Uh, it's there for authorities. It's a self-declaration. It places responsibility on the manufacturer or importer of the goods who become responsible for the compliance. Test houses uh, won't assume responsibility for the product, but they can help you. Some directives require you to consult a notified body, the RMTTE directive, medical directive, ATEX, machinery, and so on and so forth. Those directives will tell you clearly that that is required. CE marking um, is not evidence of compliance in itself. It's just evidence that the person who put it there claims compliance. So what are EU directives? Well, the, the CE marking directives are all what we call the new approach directives. The new approach, of course, though, has been around since 1985, so it's not really very new anymore. And the directives are written in general terms and lay out these essential requirements which are, are, are very broad. They can't easily be used as a technical map for compliance. But the harmonized standards, which are harmonized to each of the EU directives, can. More detail on harmonized standards later. The evidence to demonstrate conformity takes the form of a technical file on the product, and more of that later. Once you've met all of the essential requirements, then you place the CE marking on the product. And that CE marking means that you can move the uh, product around the European community or European economic area. There are 20 plus directives that require a CE marking. I, I, I say 20 plus here because otherwise I would have to keep updating this slide. Currently it's 24 and one regulation. And here's a list of uh, some of their titles in English. And furthermore, okay, now the different directives gradually will adopt the same set of responsibilities. Uh, that will be the new legal framework. So there's a little bit about the new responsibilities for legal operators. The new legal framework has been created to ensure that the responsibilities are the same in all the CE marking directives. Previously, there have been some differences in responsibilities. The new framework will add what the EC considers to be the best practice across the board. It will be added to any revisions of existing CE marking directives and to all new ones. So it will take time to fully roll out across all of the directives. The manufacturer um, 
is responsible for compliance. They can't pass that responsibility off to somebody else. And you are the manufacturer if the product is marketed under your brand name, if you have the product made on your behalf, or if you make the product yourself. An authorised representative can act as an agent for the manufacturer, liaising with the authorities in the European Union, but the manufacturer retains responsibility. More on that shortly. The manufacturer's responsibilities are that they must carry out a conformity assessment, uh, compile the technical documents, more on those shortly, uh, provide a declaration of conformity, provide safety instructions, ensure traceability, keep the documentation for 10 years, apply a model number and batch number to the product and your name and address, and then lastly put the CE marking on. Generally though, you, your address can be abbreviated to a postcode and country code. So for example, PO15 5RL, UK would be enough to give the address of uh, Tufsud's Octagon House. Broadly, an authorised representative acts as a liaison between the manufacturer and the authorities. So an authorised representative is a natural or legal person established in the European Union who, explicitly designated by a non-European manufacturer, acts on his behalf in carrying out certain tasks required in the applicable directive. Their responsibilities are that they would act as a representative for manufacturers inside or outside the European Union. They must but they themselves, the authorised rep, must be located within the European Union. They act on behalf of the manufacturer. They must be formally appointed and uh, have a contractual agreement defining those responsibilities. But they, importers and distributors are not necessarily uh, authorised representatives unless they've been formally appointed. An authorised rep has administrative responsibilities only in that they can't modify the product on their own initiative. They, the changes have to be driven by the manufacturer. An importer, the uh, definition that uh, the European Commission gives us is that when goods are produced in third countries and the manufacturer is not represented in the European economic area, Importers must make sure that the products they place on the market comply with the applicable requirements and do not present a risk to the European public. The importer has to verify that the manufacturer outside the European Union has taken the necessary steps and that the documentation is available upon request. Clearly, they've got a key role in guarantee and compliance. We'll expand on this in the next few slides. Importers must check that the manufacturer has upheld their end of the requirements. So you need to check that the manufacturer has um, carried out all of their all, all of their uh, responsibilities that we've just looked at on the previous few slides. And if you're in doubt, you shouldn't put the product on the market. And if you find that um, you gain doubt, so to speak, um, later on, once you've already put the product on the market, then you need to take corrective actions if the product's already out there. Importers should ask to see evidence of the manufacturer's assessment and technical documentation. That can be by checking third-party certification and lab reports for the product. But you'll also need to see that the right markings and instructions have been provided. And you keep this evidence for 10 years, including a copy of the Declaration of Conformity. Importers also have to maintain links with the manufacturer to ensure that the technical documentation can be provided to the authorities during that time. I would recommend a written contract to show that the technical documentation will be available. You'll need to put your name and address on the product too, to say that you are the importer. A distributor um, is a uh, Generally, it would be a, a wholesaler or a retailer or somebody else who takes products that have already been placed on the market in the European Union, and then they, the distributor moves it only within the European Union. So they're not involved in the import into the European economic area. They're, they're only involved in moving it around the European economic area. So distributors must act with due care to ensure that their handling of the product does not adversely affect its compliance.
you should have some method, a checklist or some other assessment document for each product to show that you've taken care to make sure that the product is compliant. The distributor's handling of the product mustn't make the product non-compliant. Don't leave electrical goods out in the rain or crushed at the bottom of stacked pallets or that sort of thing. Distributors need to check that the product has the right documents and markings before putting it on the market. So the declaration of conformity, instructions, name and address of the manufacturer or importer and so on. A little bit more on identification, addresses and traceability. If the manufacturer is inside the European Union, then the manufacturer's address can go on the uh, can go on, on the product or the product's uh, documentation. And that applies even if actual production occurs outside the European Union. Now I should then clarify a little bit about what I mean by manufacturer. A manufacturer is the person who designs and um, conceptualizes the product, not necessarily the factory that actually builds it. So you might design the product and then have that product built in the Far East, for example. The Far East factory doesn't take on the responsibilities as the manufacturer. You, the designer, retain the responsibility. You are the manufacturer. If the manufacturer is outside the European Union, say in America or China or wherever, then the manufacturer's address should be marked on the product and also the importer's address, the person who first imported the product into the European Union. For own branded products, if you've removed all other brand names from the product so that you have, it is only your own brand that goes on the product, then the importer and distributor's address only needs to be placed on that product. All of these may be preceded by manufactured by, imported by, or distributed by, and so on, in order to uh, clarify what these addresses are all about. Type, batch, serial, or model numbers, or some other element allowing uh, identification, like an SKU, it must link to the declaration of conformity. The manufacturer or importer's name or trademark needs to go on the product, and all of these identifications must be such that they allow traceability of the product. Uh, various other markings are required by various different directives uh, in order to uh, meet the requirements. For example, the low voltage directive requires markings of the uh, product's electrical rating. Who's doing the enforcement and how is the enforcement done for CE marking? Well, the legal status of directives is such that they're adopted into law by the member states. In the UK, they're turned into statutory instruments, and here's a list of the few we'll look at today. Outside the UK, EU directives are adopted into local laws in roughly the same way. Essentially, we all add our local legal preamble to the front of our local language version of the directive text and our local enforcement framework to the end. The RNTTE directive there at the bottom is under review at the moment. I'll include some detail on the later, latest decisions when we look at that directive shortly. In the UK, enforcement is done by the Health and Safety Executive for machinery, pressure vessels, ATEX and so forth, by local trading standards departments within their region for consumer products, MRHA for medical devices, Ofcom for management of the radio spectrum, and ROS is enforced by the National Measurements Office. Enforcement authorities can challenge any product on the market by random sampling or in response to a complaint. Uh, where non-compliances are found, authorities alert each other via the Rapid Exchange website, the RAPEX website. Uh, I'll show you um, an example of that later. Authorities can ban products or recall uh, products or worse, uh, but fines and imprisonment are only really likely in the case of non-cooperation, repeat offences and so forth. But they're good incentives to get the buy-in of your senior management. 
that's uh, the address of the RAPEX website, the European Rapid Alert Exchange, for non-food products. There are weekly reports on there, and it's just recently been updated with a search facility in the last year, uh, which is really helpful to um, search to check products that you're buying to see whether or not they're already in f subject to some enforcement by uh, one of the member states. Due diligence then, what is it? Well, some laws create a number of offences that simply contain an absolute prohibition against doing something, that is, placing non-compliant products on the market. It won't matter that you didn't intend to do wrong. The fact that you've contravened the law is sufficient to allow a court to convict. But the due diligence defence allows you to prove that you took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence to avoid committing the offence. The due diligence defence, then, is the reason that you need to be sure of your technical documentation. Knowing what is required is key to the due diligence defence. You'll need to verify the requirements of the directive. It's not going to be sufficient if the enforcement authorities turn up asking you about your compliance with the RNTTE directive to shrug your shoulders and say you don't know what the RNTTE directive is. Demonstrating compliance, you need to check that you've met the requirements in some way. Sometimes you'll need to get a notified body involved, depending on the directive and the product category. Some examples of that later. You'll need to declare that you've met the relevant requirements. You need to issue a declaration of conformity, that is. And you need to be properly prepared, ready to defend yourself in court uh, with a technical file that demonstrates compliance with the directives. Applying the directives, then, each of the directives has its own scope, essential requirements, and set of exemptions, which are not aligned with each other. The exemptions need to be read with the scope of the directive in question. So, concentrating on the electrical CE directives, here are some examples. Electromagnetic compatibility, the scope of it is that it applies to all electrical and electronic apparatus which are liable to cause electromagnetic disturbance, or the performance of which is liable to be affected by such disturbance. Exemptions, equipment covered by the R and TTE directive, um, aeronautical equipment covered by that regulation there, radio equipment used by radio amateurs, and benign equipment. Benign equipment is um, generally, the, the, the example that's frequently given is uh, the, the musical greetings card, um, which has got a very, very low power circuit, and its function is not really safety critical in any uh, shape or form. The, others, the other exemptions there are all covered by their own uh, licensing and regulations. The essential requirements of the EMC directive boil down to the idea that equipment must not interfere with or itself be interfered with by other electrical or electronic equipment. As you can see, that's not really very explanatory and you couldn't easily test a product to show that it met those requirements without some additional guidance from things like harmonised standards. The Low Voltage Directive, then, applies to all electrical equipment designed for use with a voltage rating between 50 and 1000 volts AC and 75 to 1500 volts DC. The exemptions, uh, well, the first four exemptions there, explosive atmospheres, medical and radiology, lifts and electricity meters, are essentially the same as the fifth products covered by other EC directives. Plugs and socket outlets for domestic use are covered by national regulations. Electric fence controllers are designed to give electric shocks, so they can't be covered by these rules. And lastly there, specialised electrical equipment for use on ships, aircraft or railways, where they are covered by the special regulations for ships, aircraft or railways. Even with exemptions, the General Product Safety Directive will still apply, so products will still need to be made safe. So, essential health and safety requirements of the Low Voltage Directive. Products must be marked with their rated characteristics. 
they must be clearly marked with the brand name or trademark. If it's not possible to put that on the product, then you can put that on the packaging. And they must be made in a way so as to assure that they can be safely assembled and connected. And that both means assembled and connected in the factory so that um, compliance of the product is not reliant on the uh, competence or otherwise of your uh, factory assembly process. And it also means uh, assembly and connection by the end user. So good instructions to tell people how to connect things up safely. They need to protect against hazards arising from the equipment to prevent harm by contact with the equipment, prevent temperature arcs or radiation that could start a fire or cause harm and so forth. Insulation must be good for foreseeable condi conditions. That is, if it fails, there must be another type of protection to back it up. For example, double insulation, basic insulation plus earth, and so on. Equipment must be safe under external influences, mechanically strong enough, proof against expected environmental conditions like ambient heat and humidity, and safe if the equipment has been overloaded. Next, we'll look at ROS, Restriction of Hazardous Substances, the Recast Directive. The scope, it says that it applies to all electrical equipment falling within categories of Annex 1 of the Directive. Annex 1 of the Directive lays out a set of categories, the last of which is other electrical and electronic equipment. That catch-all category is coming into effect in 2019. At that point, the ROS Directive becomes all-inclusive, apart from these exemptions that we have here. Military equipment, equipment designed to be sent into space. Um, if it's going to be sent into space, then it no longer becomes an environmental concern for planet Earth. This is an environmental directive. Equipment that's designed to be installed as part of another kind of equipment that is not within the scope. So uh, something that has another exemption, um, if your equipment is designed to be built into something that is outside the scope, then you needn't worry about the uh, restriction of hazardous substances directive. Large scale stationary industrial tools, fixed installations, the means of transport, that is uh, the vehicle um, that is moving the equipment around, for example, cranes, diggers, trains, things like that. Non-road mobile machinery for professional use. Again, that's we're, we're looking at uh, cranes and, and so forth. Active implantable medical devices. Uh, the reliability of these is more important than their environmental impact. That's a decision that has been made there with regards to that exemption. Photovoltaic panels are considered to give more environmental benefit than um, than the impact of including certain substances that would otherwise be restricted. And R&D equipment available only on a business-to-business -business basis covers equipment that you are using as part of your development cycle um, within uh, on, on a business-to-business uh, level with your uh, development partners. Some specific technical exemptions. There's certain restricted substances um, in certain applications that cannot be replaced by alternate materials, and they have specific exemptions. Annex 3 gives a list of technical exemptions for substances in applications where we cannot yet replace them with an alternate. These exemptions are subject to continual review. If industry doesn't reapply for the exemption, then they automatically lapse. So watch out for that sort of thing. This really applies to people who are making components rather than people who are uh, making uh, finished products. The restricted substances must not be present in any homogeneous material of the equipment in concentrations above the specified limits listed there below. Uh, homogeneous means a material that cannot be mechanically separated, alloys, compounds, resins, and so forth. Um, the example that I usually give here of um, homogeneous materials, if you consider an integrated circuit chip, which is made out of a silicon wafer, an encapsulating resin, and some copper uh, pins, then the copper pins 
and the encapsulating resin and the silicon wafer can be mechanically separated away from each other, perhaps with a hammer and chisel, but they can be mechanically separated. The resin can't be broken down any further and the silicon wafer can't be broken down any further and similarly the copper can't be broken down any further. So those would be homogeneous materials. The restricted substance levels there, 0.1% and 0.01% for cadmium, uh, those are all weight for weight. And these restricted substances are going to be reviewed in July this year, 2014. Um, so those levels may change and new substances may be added to, to this list. So watch that space. We'll keep you informed. Technical documentation for ROS. Um, the EN50581 standard is the harmonized standard for ROS. It's the only harmonized standard for ROS. It assumes that it's too difficult to test all the components in your product and that you should instead control your supply chain. From the least stringent to the most stringent, um, the method by which you would do that would be to obtain um, component level declarations and contractual agreement. Then you might look for material declarations and then finally you might look for analytical test results. The idea being that if you don't believe the supplier declaration that you're being given, then you can ask for a material declaration. And if you don't believe the, the material declaration that you get, then you can ask for analytical test results. Why you would not believe things is entirely down to you. You need to document your decisions on trustworthiness. It is your decision, especially regarding suppliers, but you need to give some sort of rationale for your technical documentation. You can consider whether or not the material or part is likely to contain the restricted substance. Make a technical judgment on there by looking at information from the industry, a little bit of investigation on the types of parts. Considering whether the supplier is trustworthy is a little bit more difficult. Your historical experience with the supplier, results of any inspections or audits that you've carried out or that other people have carried out um, and are publicly available, these are the sorts of things that you should consider when you're thinking about trustworthiness of suppliers. Moving on then to the RNTTE directive. It applies to all radio and telecommunications terminal equipment with certain exclusions as defined in the directive. The exemptions then, amateur radio equipment that's not commercially available, radios for use exclusively by the state for security purposes and by security purposes here they mean military, equipment within the scope of the marine equipment directive, radios on display at trade exhibitions, broadcast sound and television receivers, except for line termination equipment such as set-top boxes. Now, incidentally, by line termination equipment, uh, what I'm talking about is something that connects to the public telephone network or similar, uh, something that's got a hard, uh, a, a, a wired connection to the telecoms network. Cabling and wiring um, is exempt from uh, the radio and telecommunications terminal equipment directive in that um, antenna cables and LAN cables and things like that, those, are, those aren't part of the, the scope. The health and safety requirements for RNTTE are the same as you would find for the low voltage directive, including some RF exposure requirements. And the EMC requirements are the same as you would find in the EMC directive. And the efficient use of the spectrum is um, that radio equipment must be so constructed that it uses the spectrum allocated to terrestrial radio uh, communications and orbital resources so as to avoid harmful interference. Now, saying that the health and safety requirements and the EMC requirements as covered by the low voltage directive and the EMC directive doesn't mean that it is the low voltage directive itself or the EMC directive itself that you are applying to the product. It's still the RNTTE directive that is going to be used as the legal framework for any prosecution or case that might be brought against you. But the requirements for health and safety and EMC are those that you will find in those other directives. The point being that they didn't want to just write all of those out again in the RNTTE directive. 
However, there's a new radio equipment directive draft. There's a new scope for the radio equipment directive, which uh, we're expecting in the next uh, in in the next few years, uh, to say that it will only cover radio equipment. Line termination equipment will be removed. This draft revision of the RNTTE directive has been produced by the European Commission. It's driven by concerns about low levels of compliance with the current directive uh, for some categories of equipment and, and huge increases that we've had over the last uh, decade or so in the use of wireless and mobile devices. The new draft is intended to be simpler and stronger. Being a draft, these new items are of course not yet final, but to keep you abreast, I'll run through them here. The, uh, the new scope covers all radio equipment below 3000 gigahertz. Previously, there was a lower limit of 9 kilohertz, and that lower limit has been removed. And radio equipment now means a product which intentionally emits radio waves in order to serve its purpose, or a product which must be completed with an accessory such as an antenna so as to emit radio waves in order to serve its purpose. Previously, the, uh, the fitting of an antenna was not clearly defined in the uh, RNTTE directive, so people tried to use that as a reason why they didn't need to comply with RNTTE. But um, when the radio equipment directive comes into force, um, that, um, that loophole will be closed. Registration of radio equipment. Uh, Article 5 of the draft introduces the possibility to require registration of products that fall within those categories showing low levels of compliance in a central database, which may improve, in, include sorry, the provision of technical documentation. This measure is intended to enhance the effectiveness of market surveillance and give a higher level of compliance with the directive. Uh, the simplified declaration of conformity uh, as an option. Um, the, the, uh, it's previously been introduced following a technical committee interpretation, but it's now been explicitly included as an option within the uh, radio directive draft. Uh, it must also it must include a um, internet or email address where the full EU declaration of conformity can be obtained and it must be available in a language or languages required by the member state in which the radio equipment is placed. Sampling of imported test equipment, of imported equipment, uh, importers will be required to carry out sampling uh, sample testing for health and safety of radio equipment that's been made available on the market. The draft uses the words when deemed appropriate with regards to the risk presented by radio equipment, so it's not really very clear when that becomes mandatory. They must also investigate and keep a register of complaints of non-conforming radio equipment and of product recalls and keep distributors informed of such monitoring. Universal charges. Um, recent proposals have uh, also included the mandating of universal battery charges, particularly for mobile phones, but um, it, this is a draft at this point, so we don't know whether or not that is definitely going to be adopted. And the estimated time in which the radio equipment directive draft will be adopted, well, there's an expected transition period of two years, so even if it were to be adopted today, um, then there would probably be a transition period, um, meaning that it wouldn't come into force until 2016 at the earliest. Uh, we will keep you informed on, on topics like that by our uh, email newsletters and so forth. So moving on to harmonised standards. I've mentioned these a couple of times uh, so far. A harmonised standard is a standard that uh, supports directives under a mandate from the member states. They're produced by CEN or CENELEC and listed in the official journal. At least one national standards body has published it and it gives you a presumption of conformity with the essential requirements. And the reason that that's important is that that presumption of conformity means that by meeting the requirements of the harmonised standard, you are presumed to conform. Your, your product is... You, 
you are shown to have done what is necessary to meet the essential requirements with regards to what that harmonised standard is written to, to cover. So for the safety standards, you're considered to have met the essential safety requirements of the relevant directives. So directives give you the legal objectives, the essential requirements that you need to meet, broad essential legal requirements. Harmonised standards then give you the technical means to show compliance. They are not mandatory, but your equipment is presumed to conform, as I've said, to the essential requirements if you meet the applicable harmonised standards. And it's very useful to have that presumption of conformity. Harmonised standards may look difficult and hard to uh, use, but it's a lot easier to use them than it is to try and work out how to meet those essential requirements for, the, for these directives uh, on your own. All the hard work has been done for you and the tests have been defined for you when you cons consider a harmonised standard. Technical files then, moving on to technical files. Your technical file is your documented evidence to show that the product properly complies with the requirements of the directives which apply to it. Technical file, technical documentation, technical construction file, these terms are all the same thing. The term just depends on the directive that you're, you're reading. They'll all use uh, the, 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 this equivalent term. So um, when I say technical files and technical documentation, I'm talking about the same kind of thing. So a technical documentation must be it there enabled to enable enforcement authorities to assess the conformity of the product to the requirements of the directives. So it needs to be written in any EU language. The authorities are entitled to demand that the technical file is provided to them in any of the official European Union languages. So you should be prepared to get a technical translation of any language dependent parts of your technical file. So um, the instruction manuals and so on and so forth, you should be ready to do that. It's not necessary to do it in advance, but um, the enforcement authorities are entitled to demand that. It needs to cover the design, manufacture and operation of the equipment. Usually we'd expect it to be the same document as your design file for the equipment. When you're designing equipment, you'll produce a whole load of documentation and this is the same sort of information that is required for a technical file. It forms the basis of your compliance case. So you need to show in your technical documentation how you know you meet the requirements of the applicable directives. Things that have to be in your technical file. General description of the equipment. Usually you can have that in the equipment manual. Conceptual design, a block diagram, general assembly drawing, photographs and so forth. Circuit diagrams for electronic products are, are vital. Uh, and all of these must be related to the year and um, model number uh, of, the, of the particular product. As I'll mention later, um, your technical file must be a live document, so any revisions that you make must be reflected in your design documentation. Descriptions and explanations necessary for understanding the drawings and schemes previously referred to and the operation of the electrical equipment. Again, your equipment manual probably meets those requirements, uh, but you might need to include some extra schematics. A list of the standards applied in full or in part and descriptions of any solutions adopted to satisfy the safety requirements. Basically, you need to explain how you have met the requirements of the directive. Here you can just list the harmonised standards that you've applied, if you're applying harmonised standards. If you're going outside harmonised standard routes, then you need to explain yourself a little further. Lists of components, a complete listing of all components, basically a bill of materials, and safety approval information for critical components and materials. Now, a critical component, a safety critical component, would be a component that if you were to replace it with another component of different specification, that would impair safety. So consider fuses, power supplies, mains cables, and so on and so forth. Those are all probably going to be safety critical components. Consider whether or not replacing it with another component of different specification would affect safety. 
that's the rule of thumb to use for safety critical components. Design calculations made, experiments and so forth that you've carried out, test reports uh, from third party labs can cover that sort of thing, um, and uh, your own internal test reports that you may have made um, to show that you meet the harmonized standards. And then lastly, a declaration of conformity is required as part of your technical documentation. In format, a technical file at least has to contain all of that information that we've just mentioned. It can be a traditional paper file, but more commonly these days it's all electronic. Um, I would really recommend that um, all of these uh, documents are going to be scattered around your intranets um, uh, in the design folders and in your, your testing folders and so on and so forth around your intranet. As a, a contents page of hyperlinks to link to the various documents uh, can be established and that can be the, the, the front end of your technical file. But you need to make sure that those hyperlinks remain good throughout the lifetime of the product and the 10 years that you need to keep your technical documentation after the product has gone on the market. You need to back it up and you need to be able to produce all that documentation on short notice. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it's got to be maintainable and up to date. You can't just make a, te a technical document and then forget about it. I've heard a great anecdote about a uh, technical document that was locked in a filing cabinet in, in the back of the warehouse, covered in dust and so forth, and had never been updated in the 10 years that the product had been on the market, although the product had been updated during that lifetime. Um, you've got to keep these documents up to date because otherwise your technical documentation becomes irrelevant. The Declaration of Conformity, what goes in it and what is it for? It's a formal statement that your product complies with the applicable directives and applicable standards. It's a legal attestation of conformity with all the relevant directives. By making a declaration of conformity, you assume sole legal responsibility and liability for compliance with the directives. So the signatory may be subject to prosecution. So it needs to be signed by a responsible person within the organization. Company director is the kind of level that uh, I would expect to see. But at the same time, it needs to be somebody who is not so far detached from the manufacturing of the product that they wouldn't have the knowledge to understand when the product was being made uh, whether the product was being made compliant or non-compliant. So you need to be somebody who is connected with manufacture, so a technical director or a senior manager in the technical team. It's not evidence of compliance in itself. The evidence of compliance is your technical documentation, but it's the minimum legal requirement that you're expected to pass around declarations of conformity. Um, it's the first port of call usually for most enforcement authorities. They'll ask to see your declaration of conformity first, and then maybe they'll want to look into the technical file in more detail. Declaration of conformity needs to include name and address of the manufacturer, description of the product, Reference of the standards applied, harmonized standards when you've applied those. Um, if you don't go down the harmonized standards route, then uh, you need to detail the, 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 the non-harmonized standards that you've used. And then in your technical documentation, you need to explain how you, how you know those standards that you have applied meet the essential requirements of the directives. Identification of the signatory. Um, the you can't read my signature, uh, and even if you could read my signature, you wouldn't necessarily know what my position in the company was. So you need to give the um, position and name as well as the actual signature for the signatory. And the last two digits of the year in which CE marking was affixed need to go on there. You can put the whole date down, but just the last two digits of the year are required. Placing on the market and putting into service then. Market surveillance, that is verification by the authorities that products comply with the directive's requirements, is carried out either when a product is placed on the market or when it's put into service. It will be stated in the directive when surveillance happens. Generally for consumer products, that's when the products are placed on the market. 
Placing on the market is the initial action of making a product available for the first time on the community market with a view to distribution or use in the community. Now, that doesn't have to be for money, it can be for free. And um, it's important to note that that's without the need for any further processing, packaging or labeling and so on and so forth. If you have a collection of products in your warehouse and the last thing that you do before you ship them is add uh, a country specific mains cable to it, the moment that you seal that box up after you've put the country specific mains cable is the point at which you've put it on the market. That's worth considering when you think about uh, compliance because that is the moment at which it must comply with the current regulation as opposed to the moment when you built it and put it into the warehouse prior to putting that mains cable in there. That can become quite significant. Products put into service are only subject to market surveillance if there's a chance that there might be an issue that's not caught when the product is placed on the market. So putting into service takes place at the moment of first use within the community by the end user. Market surveillance is only carried out on those sorts of products if they're only used after assembly or installation, or if they could be negatively influenced by transport or storage, or if they're not first placed on the market prior to being put into service. That's important for things like the Machinery Directive and other such uh, directives which are concerned more with um, health and safety rather than consumer safety because consumer safety is, is considering um, products that have been placed on the market for general consumers. Before products are placed on the market or put into service, uh, the following has to happen. The uh, manufacturer must put together the technical documentation, produce a declaration of conformity, and apply the CE marking. Once you put the CE marking on, then you can ship it anywhere in the European Union or European Economic Area. A quick word then about fulfillment houses. Um, fulfillment houses are companies like eBay, Amazon Market, and so forth, um, who act as a freight forwarding business. They receive goods from a vendor, store it in a warehouse, await details for dispatch from the vendor, and then dispatch the goods to the consumer. They don't generally examine the goods for documentation. But they're, under the new legal framework, they've been given uh, the, they've been defined as distributors. So they weren't previously very well addressed under the old directives and legislation. So now they have an obligation to ensure the compliance of products. So previously they weren't examining goods or documentation and now they will have to. Freight forwarding businesses will uh, have to do that um, when they're uh, shipping goods into the European Union. So in summary, we looked at uh, what is CE marking, um, a little bit about uh, European directives, applying them, ROS, EMC, LVD, and RTTE, harmonized standards, how to compile a technical file, what has to go in your declaration of conformity, and placing products on the market. So thank you very much for listening, and at this point, I'll open up for questions. <laughs>